All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is March 14th, 2024. Of course, you know, we see it on the news and everywhere. It is pie day, and I'm a big fan of pies, although I don't think I'm getting one today. Um, but with that, welcome. And today we're going to see some new connections, some more revelation. You know, it, it's very interesting to see how the Holy Ghost works because, you know, it's <laughs> I've seen it happen so many times throughout the ministry that I'm going down a path and then I set it aside and or somebody shares something with me and I try to find something or or I have them, you know, reference something and either there's something or there's not. And, you know, it gets set aside and and I just maybe dismiss it and maybe I'll come back to it and we'll see what happens. And uh, lo and behold, something else comes. And that has happened so many times I lost track. And today is one of those teachings. It's. There was, uh, I can't recall who it was. It, I believe it was a brother about, um, oh, maybe two or three weeks ago who had shared um, something about an angel. And I thought, I went and looked and that the angel could also mean something else. <clears throat> but the definition was clearly not. And in, in being something else, that it had to be an angel. And so I asked the person, because where it was was very potentially interesting if it was this other thing. So I, I responded to them and I said, hey, if you could find something, you know, that, that shows this, because I don't know why that person would say it. I can't find any, any answers to this. And according to the description, it, it's definitely not. So uh, they went and looked and they came back and they said, no, I'm sorry, I can't find anything either. And so it was one of those set aside and dismiss things until... I was shared a video just a few days ago uh, by our brother Clive, and Clive doesn't know that this was something that was asked about uh, asked of me about two or three weeks earlier because I've never spoken on it. We know that there's a connection to this time. I don't believe Clive was directly showing me that por portion, but I believe it was probably part of it, and it lit up <clears throat> because... You're going to see that even the, I believe he's a Messianic rabbi, uh, even he, when he came across, he did the exact same thing I did. So I said, wait a second, hold on, hold on. Let me take this a step further and really dig a little bit deeper. And lo and behold, there it was. And it's awesome how it works. I, like I said, it, when, when the Holy Spirit has worked so much, and, and it's not audibles, it's not visions and dreams or any of that, it's, it's the leading of the Holy Ghost. It's the leading through the scriptures and these books opening and their understanding and the evidence being connected over and over and over, story after story after story, all the way through. And this was one of those connectors because in the video I did here, Leviathan and Bohemoth, there was a person who asked me in the comments, about, oh, you don't know, you know, you never mentioned who the third one is. And I said, yeah, in fact, I did mention who it was. And he said a name. And I set that name aside. I went and looked, and I'm like, well, yeah, we know who that is. We talk about him, you know, within this as well. And, but I thought nothing of it. Until, of course, these two things intersected in that video that was shared with me by Clive. And I'm going to show you a couple clips. The first clip, as we get further into the video, that's when I'm going to get into it. But the first clip, when we get to it, uh, was something else I'd been kind of pondering. And here this Messianic rabbi, again, I believe Messianic rabbi, is understanding this piece of scripture that is directly connected to what they believe the Jews are expecting. And he tries to connect it to Matthew and to Luke. <clears throat> we know that these words aren't Matthew words, that they're only Luke words. And I'm going to show you what it was that he said, and it relates to some of their ancient Hebrew writings, and it lines up with what we know about the coming of the Son of Man. So we're going to be going through things. You know what? It may not even be a very long video here today. Um, I would expect under two hours, but who knows how it goes and what trail we go down. I, I leave it up to the Holy Ghost, but I've got a I've got a kind of idea planned out as to where I'm going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're gonna have some fun with this. 
we're going to open up with a, a confirmation as well uh, from another brother that I know many of us have been watching uh, every once in a while here because of the guests that he has on, and I'll share you that uh, as we get going as well. But for anybody that's new, we have revealed, we, we have what's called here, it's called Ministry Revealed, where the 14-year tribulation understanding and the open books are revealed. We don't take that lightly. We didn't just make up these words and throw them out there just to, to anger people and to make people think that, uh, oh, these guys are so boastful and proud. No. All we ask you to do is to seek these things out for yourselves. That's it. And the first thing we always recommend people to do is go to the playlist link right here. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com, go to the tab that's called Intro, and watch the first four videos. So here, since you're on YouTube, you can come to this YouTube link right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. You can see there's 12 videos in this playlist. Watch the first four videos. The first video is a 22-minute intro about what you're going to begin to understand in the next three. The second video is a 30-minute, a 30-minute Bible study of what we call the revelation of the differences in the Gospels. And I promise you, if you're new to the ministry or newer or haven't, and haven't yet watched, it'll be worth every moment of your time. Because I can guarantee everybody who has studied their scriptures, especially just in the Gospels, like in the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know that there are differences within the same stories that seem contradictory. And maybe you believe what the pastors have told you that, you know, it was just a perspective at the time. That's not true. You're going to see for yourself that there's no way, like Jesus going to the cross, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful, in Luke's. In Mark's, he was arrayed in purple. And in Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. We always say, you know, these guys weren't colorblind. So when 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 Luke got his account, how how did he get that account? Why did he get a gorgeous robe when the other two had already said purple and scarlet? You know that Luke, as the bride of Christ, as Jesus dressed in radiant, gorgeous white robe. Well, it's like Matthew, Mark and Luke, of the synoptic gospels. The last will be first. The first will be last. Luke's is the Gentile bride of Christ. Mark and Matthew. Guess what they are? Tribulation colors, right? Purple and scarlet are the colors that the woman riding the beast wears. Interesting how that happens. Or you go to the, the story of the crucifixion, and the last words from Jesus in Luke are, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit. Okay, that's like going to the Father is going to be in his arms. But in Mark and in Matthew, along with the purple and scarlet, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken in both Mark and Matthew means to leave behind was jesus worried about being left behind no of course not he was leaving us prophetic understanding all of these differences those are just two simple beginners they're all throughout the gospels and it will absolutely blow your mind and that first 30 minute or the second video but the 30 minute of the differences in the gospels will begin to open up your understanding in a way that will help you to read scripture will help you to understand the storyline and you will see for yourself that Luke is written to the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ, those who are in Christ spirit filled. You're going to see that Mark's group is the group that goes through seals and they will be part of the great multitude mid-trib rapture, which is the world, the sleeping church there. They, they believe in Christ, but they weren't really ready, not quite spirit filled. That's the great multitude rapture in Revelation 7. That is the mid-trib. And they are the world, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. And then you have Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew's gospel, it relates to the post-trib return. It is written to the house of Judah. And it is about the feet down return of the Lord at the end. You're going to find out that pre, mid, and post are all true. And that's why everybody who can go to scripture or who wants to defend pre or defend mid or defend post can all go to scripture and give you their points from scripture. We reveal here by the differences in the gospels, the answer is all three are true. So now which one do you want to be? Do you want to wait till mid seals? Or would you rather be in Christ spirit filled now? Ready, watching, diligently seeking the Lord, just like Enoch. 
That's the difference. That's what these things are going to reveal and help you prepare for and give you understanding of to help you diligently dig into the Lord more. The third video is another 30 minute intro to the revelation of the 14 years of tribulation. You got it. You're going to see because everybody has been taught from the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke were only little side notes. And so when you go read from the from the rest of Scripture, everybody's foundation, unbeknownst to them, is based in Matthew's viewpoint. And so everything they've seen is only seven years. <clears throat> and that's why the church will tell you everybody who's a part of the church, everybody who claims Christ is going pre-trib. Nope. That's absolutely 100% not true. They're not spirit-filled in Christ, repentant, diligently seeking the Lord. That's the difference. And if, if you don't know that Mark's portion of seals is seven years of seals, and then it's seven years of trumpets, and the whole world only understands seven years, and they call it only Jacob's trouble in the seven years for the Jews— it's as if they're at the end of seals. They're in that seventh year of seals, and they're waiting for the great multitude rapture. Unfortunately, they've missed the understanding of what seals is for and who it's for. That's what you're going to find out in the third. It's only a 30-minute. It is all with Scripture, all from the Bible study. Greek, Hebrew words from the King James Bible. It's, I promise you, it'll be worth every moment of your time. And the fourth video is a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. It's called It's All Because of Matthew. And the reason that video is so important is it's going to open your eyes to help you understand and see for yourselves how this was all missed. And the simple answer is because we've all been taught from a foundational gospel of Matthew. So everybody's perspective is through the eyes of Matthew. And so when people go to Matthew's discourse and try to tell you it's pre-trib, they are really, really confused because it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. There are so many things we could show you in the discourses too. In fact, if you go to this playlist or to the ministryrevealed.com and go to the intro page, the one of the following videos after that, those four, is where you can go deeper and it'll be a three-hour teaching on many of the differences within the Gospels and revealing that every single one of them is a prophetic insight to the end of days. And then what will follow after that one is the differences in the discourses. And you will see for yourself the understanding and the revelation of the discourses. It will blow your mind, but you must start with those intro videos. I promise you, it'll be worth your time. And the, the, the joy that you will get the, the ability to understand prophecy in, in a light and in a revelation of understanding as you have never, ever seen before will get you so excited if you're a watchman, if you're really seeking and diligently watching for the Lord. This, this will excite you beyond anything you have ever studied prophetically. That's how powerful it is. <clears throat> All right. So. Uh, what did I want to get into? I thought there was something I was going to mention a moment ago. It slipped my mind. I think part of it anyways is going to be as I, as I get going into this. Because, you know, uh, I might as well mention it now. That we are, we, I couldn't have done, obviously it's the leading of the Holy Ghost. It, it's unequivocal. I know it's the Holy Ghost. And I've had that one event with the Holy Ghost. And the, the evidence, you see, I, I used to, talk about this and even within my prayers and it still creeps in on occasion but not as often as it used to and that is that you know sometimes it would be like lord is is this really happening are these books really opening is it really but i don't really go down that path anymore because how much evidence you know the the thoughts that come to my to my head now when i think about it and i ponder these things is how many hundreds of connections do you need to realize it's all true Right? How many connections do we need? How much evidence has to be out there to prove to you that every piece of it is true? How can we keep connecting from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation, book after book after book after book, if we didn't understand? You see? No other ministry can go from book to book to book showing the pre, the mid, the post, showing the events connected to it, showing their time frames. 
showing how the different go uh, the different gospels make a difference within the the other books as we go and read them and reveal these things that are in the prophetic that are coming in the 14 years and what we call above which is the 50 days that comes first it's incredible but we did it with the king james bible and that's what i wanted to say that i don't believe i could have done it without the king james bible when i first was kind of occasionally reading my bible a verse here verse there watching other prophecy ministries back seven years ago i was using the new king james because the these thou thou and all, all that stuff it was just like mumbo jumbo to me and then i thought okay well i'm gonna start reading the king james because these other guys are in the king james and i'd go into the king james and as you guys know when everything changed for me in september of 2017 and i started to understand revelation at the beginning of it um everything was king james and when i went into it you know we have proven and other ministries out there have proven that the king james is the absolute best but it doesn't mean it has absolutely every nook and cranny does it have i don't know i can't give it a number is it virtually the perfect word yes but is there occasion where maybe a word isn't used or a word is used yes it doesn't make it wrong it could make it more of a mystery if you will and that's the type of thing that we're going to get into as this gets going here today and so you'll you'll see as we get there what i'm talking about and it's just very exciting because guys it is more confirmation that we have understood these things they're in their place they're in their year they're exactly where they're sh where they should be so let's have a look first of all i thought i'd share this with you guys i know many of you guys had probably heard of it but because of the eclipse that's coming all of this stuff goes on the back end right these aren't locusts of course they are cicadas listen to what this says it's the year of the dragon for observers of a lunar new year but in north america 2024 is the year of the cicada for the first time in 221 years two broods of cicadas not locusts that spend the vast majority of their lives underground will emerge invading backyards in 17 states when you go in to read on this i posted on this uh in the forum when if anybody you know if you're new and you hear me talking about the forum you can go to ministryrevealed.com go to the menu on the drop down you'll see forum you can click on there it'll take uh five ten seconds and you can join brothers and sisters it's free of charge join uh 1200 or so brothers and sisters from around the world posting sharing you know like-minded brothers and sisters um just gathering together from all parts of the world so um i shared this in the forum and they say when they when they look at the you know per acre and how many per acre and the whole nine yards there's going to be approximately one trillion one trillion <laughs> cicadas breaking out i think sometime later in march or april and probably done by about july the good thing is i guess they don't really eat too much on uh, on the on the um vegetation from what i've read anyways and there's not much talk on it otherwise there probably would have been but they lay their eggs in in the vegetation so that's not a good thing either right so that sounds like absolute madness and chaos. A trillion of these big suckers in 17 U.S. states. Funny how that works, right? Funny how that works in the midst of this great sign that's happening on April 8th. You think the Lord is trying to warn America? You think maybe there's a little bit of a warning taking place? Of course there is. Unequivocally, absolutely there is. It's incredible. So again, just something you know, be aware of if you're driving in those states when this is happening. It might be a, a little difficult at certain times of day, but remember, just let it be another warning and say, "Yes, Lord, I am ready. I am watching." Okay. Give me a second. Just had a little internet glitch, but I think everything is still continuing, so I'm going to keep it going. All right. So again, 
you know, just another thing to be aware of. The Lord is warning and 2024 is in hyperdrive. So let me now go to this. I wanted to share this with you guys. This was something also shared in the forum. And a brother had said, you know, um, again, sorry, I say brother. I don't remember if it was a brother or sister. I believe it was a brother who shared a clip of, uh, of this for us to watch in the forum. Now, many of you guys see this is Randy K. He has people that have gone to heaven, right, that have died, that have had these dreams and visions, uh, that have, actually, I don't think it was dreams and visions, but that have died and gone to heaven. And um, he has many, many people uh, on his channel, and he has a ministry and so forth. And so there have been some pretty wild ones, and we've been able to appoint to a couple that we can understand scripturally. Now, I wanted to share this with you for our reasons in this ministry, because about, listen carefully, He's going to say about a year ago, the Lord told him and I believe his wife about their ministry. Listen to this. I'm going to share with you with you something personal. When God spoke to Renee and us about a year ago, he told us that we had 14 years to fulfill our ministry. I don't know what that meant. Does it mean that our ministry will end or be completed on or about 20 20, 28? Does it mean that I will return to heaven about that time? Or does it mean something else? I do know. Pretty wild, right? Last year, he said about a year ago, okay? And this just came out a day or two ago. I think uh, uh, today or yesterday, last night. And he said about a year ago, the Lord told him and his wife, his family, that his ministry had 14 more years. You know why that's a big deal to us? Let me show you something. We know that it's what? The end of days is 14 years. But you might say, wait a second, Alan. He said about a year ago. So that would mean there's only about 13 years left. Exactly. <laughs> For anybody who had watched the last video, you should grasp what that means. Okay? You should grasp what that means for those who have watched the last video. Because the reason there would be 13 years is because there are six years of seals and the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. He destroys the enemies. He seals the 144. The great multitude mid-trib happens in the seventh year. He makes a covenant with the nations. They're there during the first three and a half years of trumpets, the city, the streets, and the temple get rebuilt. And then Messiah is cut off in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years into all of tribulation. Satan is told he has but a short time. That short time we've shown from Daniel 12 is two and a half years of the final three and a half years. So why is it 13 years that remain? When he was told 14 and the end of days is 14, because the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of 13 years, and the, the, uh, um, the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance, is the 14th year. At the beginning of the 14th year, at the end of 13, start of the 14th year, the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, just as we're told in Zechariah chapter 14. We've shown this many, many times. So how fitting that in 2023, about a year ago, he said the Lord told him he had 14 more years in his ministry and 13 are about 13 are left. And that's exactly the return feet down of the Lord. That's exciting. I wanted to share that with you because I thought that was very exciting. I could also share with you guys something that that is not exciting about it. But I'm not going to because I do believe this is the year. <clears throat> so just like he said, he doesn't really he doesn't know what it means when he knows that, hey, if there's seven years of this and then another seven years of something else. So, of course, I reached out to this guy, sent his ministry an email and uh, hopefully somebody will see it and uh, hopefully it'll reach him. And maybe I can have a private conversation with him first to help him understand it. And uh, if it's this year, we'll get ready. Sounds like he might be a worker as well, <laughs> especially if his ministry might go to the end. Who knows how that would work, right? 
unless the Lord was just revealing. His ministry might go to the end, but he doesn't know that it meant he would necessarily be going to the end, but that the ministry that he started would continue until the end. So that was pretty exciting. So now as we get going here into this, let's start in Ezekiel chapter 1. We haven't been in Ezekiel for a long time. And you'll see as we get going into all of this, there's, there's a reason beyond what I'm starting with as to why I went into Ezekiel. But there was something else that as I was reading through the last, you know, the first uh, 11 chapters or so, that really caught my attention, my attention and is directly connected to what we're also going to be talking about. So this was interesting. I didn't realize Ezekiel was a priest. So it was very interesting to see that Ezekiel was a priest. And I went and did a little bit of digging on it. Of course, Ezekiel is a priest. <clears throat> He's a Kohen. You'll remember, I've shared this, and I share it every once in a while, to show that there's something that we've understood in this, okay? This is the, the way they were placed around the, about, around the tabernacle. And whether it's one, two, three, and one, two, three, instead of a cross like this, it's not a big deal. The point is, this is on the directions they are around the tabernacle we know these are the different priestly lines from the levitical line <clears throat> because the levites were all scattered throughout all of the tribes okay and they were in different cities within these different tribes but there was different groupings of them within different areas of it so we've shown that reuben which represents the man and you have the man, the water, who is Jesus, the leader of a troop, and a sword, uh, a sword in the city gate. So we've talked about we, how the sword's coming. The Son of Man is going to be here for forty days, leading the 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 Gentile remnant workers, which is something I'm going to share as well. And this represents the the forty days of the Son of Man when he's coming as what prophet. Okay, he's coming as prophet. When he comes feet down, uh, when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming as the ox. He's coming as the Messiah ben Joseph, the Messiah ben Ephraim. At mid trumpets, there's a representation of the eagle. And what do we know comes at that point? Well, we know there's a serpent, right? The serpent comes at that point. We have uh, a leaping hind or stag, maybe a relation to the 144. And then. The Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, when the tribulation comes to an end, the story of the ass and the colt, we have the lion of the three kings, the scepter, and what? A, a, a scepter and a, a grapevine, right? The treading of the grapes in the final year, and a ship. In the past, I don't really know what that connects to. I've connected it in part to showing how uh, uh, the chapters to years in uh, in the book of Acts had a connection to Paul, but... Outside of that, a ship, you know, we can leave that to people's imagination, right? But this is a representation of the four comings of Christ. He's coming as the Son of Man for 40 days. He's coming as the ox, as Messiah ben Joseph. There's a representation of the eagle when they fly away on the wings of an eagle. Yet there's also a serpent. He flies too. and. There's, of course, when he comes back as the lion. Many of you guys might remember this. We did a video just not too long ago that was really, really exciting going down all of these trails and, and this revelation of the Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David and the coming four Messiahs. You know, some people in Christian circles might read this and say, the coming four Messiahs, oh, what a heretic. No, they're all Messiah. <clears throat> they are all Messiah. Remember, there's the, the, there's the man, the ox, the eagle, the lion. They are all representations of Christ. Where are they? Around his throne, right? Around his throne. And that's, what, that's where we're going to be going and what got me into Ezekiel. But what was first interesting is that Ezekiel, as we know, all throughout Ezekiel, he is referred to as the Son of Man. He is a priest, and 
as a priest, what else was he called? Everywhere he's called, son of man, son of man, son of man. He is a prophetic typology of Christ. And just like we know with uh, Joshua, right? Joshua, Yeshua, he becomes high priest and king. Lo and behold, that's what happens at the end of seals when the Lord's coming as high priest and king, defeating the enemies of Israel, and then the rebuilding takes place. But when he comes as the son of man, as the white horse rider, when he comes for the 40 days, as we've revealed, which is in the portion above 14 years, what have we also said that he comes as? A prophet. He's the son of man. They will know that there was a prophet among them. And he's a priest. Interesting how that works, right? You'll see what I mean as we go in into this a little bit more. But in relation even to the cicadas, and in relation to the, 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 the eclipse that's coming, and the connections from the one all the way back in 2017, and all the, the, the cities that both of them have crossed that were significant names. That's what you're reading about here in Ezekiel. <clears throat> because what you find out is all of the conversation in the early portion of Ezekiel is also warnings to what? The house of Israel. Here's this eat this roll. Again, where is that connected to? To Revelation. Where are the, the, four, the four living creatures connected to? Revelation. What, what are the warnings and what's being taught about in Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel's a prophet. And he's warning about what? Prophecy. And he's speaking here in the early portion in chapter 3, the house of Israel, the house of Israel, the house of Israel, the house of Israel. It goes on and on and on. Get thee to the captivity unto, the child, unto thy children. It's, it's very, very interesting to see because there's two things that are important in relation to prophecy. Well, many things, of course. But in this, what I'm getting at is there, there's the house of Israel and there's the house of Judah. The house of Judah, of course, is Jerusalem, the Jews. There's only about 14 or 15 million Jews worldwide. The house of Israel is the world. The house of Israel is the world and the Gentiles that are grafted into it. And they're scattered all over the world. But where is the, even though they don't always seem like it, and it depends who's in power, who's the nation that is always standing up the vast majority as a nation for Israel, for, for the land of Israel, for, for the Jews? America. America is. So oftentimes when I read stuff about judgment coming to Judah and judgment coming to the house of Israel, I believe it's going to begin in Jerusalem and then come to America. And it makes sense too, clearly, in relation to the house of Judah and, and what will happen in Jerusalem. I mean, we understand that. We know when it's coming, okay? If this is the year, we know when it's coming. But outside of that, we also know that there's stuff that's got to happen to America. Because there's no way America, with its power and might, when, when a new world order is being established, and there's going to be one that leads it all, no way America can have the power that it still has. So oftentimes, especially when I'm reading in Ezekiel, I often see it like that, that there's this Judah, the house of Judah, and the house of Israel. And of course, it does talk a lot about it as well. Even here, listen to what it says. In Ezekiel chapter four, uh, chapter three, verse four. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. <laughs> so again, in some cases you read scripture and it says people of a strange language and a foreign tongue. You can't understand, but this one you will. You got to remember, this isn't the house of Judah. This is the house of Israel. In the house of Judah, wouldn't that be a different language? It is in, in prophecy because you have the Jews and you've got the church, the world, as the house of Israel. And I believe it's a relation to America. One of the things we can gather from this is just like we did in, um, watch this, in Leviticus chapter 26. In Leviticus, you have the blessings of obedience and the punishment of disobedience. This punishment 
of disobedience and seven times, you know, we've done videos on this in the past. It's about the punishment coming and them being removed from Jerusalem, from his land for seven years. It gets very devastating. The pestilence coming against them, all of these things coming against them. When you go into, I think, is it Deuteronomy 28? Yeah, there you go. Deuteron uh, so you have your blessings for obedience, and then you have your curse for disobedience. The wording, some of them are similar, but most of it is different. And in this, it seems like one relating to the house of Israel, one relating to the house of Judah, especially when you see the difference of who's coming and who's attacking and so forth. So it makes it very interesting, and that's what I'm seeing even in Ezekiel in relation to what we're seeing as, as the Son of Man warning. Okay, We know that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days at the beginning, and he's, we know and have known for a long time that he's going to be warning the Jews. He's going to be warning them in Jerusalem. But is it possible... I mean, he's going to be here for 40 days. Is he just going to be walking around Jerusalem and that's it? Or might he translate to other nations? I don't know. But according to this, it would seem there might be something America related and world related as well. It's very interesting. So we see that Ezekiel is the priest, the son of Buzi. Let's see how this all connects. So we saw that he was a high priest connected to the Kohen. And we find out in this chart right here, which is essentially what I've shown you guys here. You'll see it when I zoom in right here. It shows the same thing. Okay, there's your Kohites, right? Your Kohath, your Gershonites, your Merites, and then it has Moses and Aaron over here. But really, they're part of the Kohites, as you'll see. And these are around the tabernacle. Why wouldn't these guys actually really need to be here in relation to the end of days? You'll find out. And in fact, there might even be a reason why you could say Aaron, Moses and Aaron and the Amorites in relation to this side of on Judah. Because you have to understand, we know the Lord is here with a group of people for 40 days. We know at the end of seals, he's here with a group enduring trumpets and then at the very end. So we see this grouping of priestly lines working. Okay, this is their portion of time. And listen to what it says. Under the Kohites, there's your Kohath. They all come from Levi. Levi had Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And of course, Aaron, who is the high, becomes the high priest, and Moses and Miriam. And you follow the line down. And of course, Who's the one that survived? Who's the one when it comes to the, um, uh, 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 they talked about it, um, uh, Qumran, right? It would say it was the Zadok priestly line. You follow that Zadok priestly line down from Moses, and you see where some of these other ones end, and it keeps going down. It goes through Joshua. You had the one line that got corrupt and at the destruction of Jerusalem, and then you had Zacharias. Zacharias, of course, brought John the Baptist. And what does it say then? You follow it down, and that's the line that continued today. And what do they call it? The priesthood of Christians. This is what this goes in to talk about here. The Levitical priesthood traces through the three sons of Levi, through the Sadducees, until it went extinct at the death of Christ, when it was replaced by the priesthood of Christians, which will endure till the second coming. Well, it doesn't, it's not going to endure till the second coming, but we know that it will endure at least till the end of seals. But you see, not like this says here, every Christian is a priest. There might be a, a little typology in it, but the reality is, is that there is a Gentile priestly line through this line from Moses, through the Zadoks, which is all from this Kohath group who is also from this Kohath group, is Ezekiel. Okay? So we've got Ezekiel connected to this group. And where is this Kohath group? Which portion are, are they? Right here. See? The Kohath. The Kohath is connected to this group right here. This group is related to what? The 40 days of the Son of Man. 
Who does Ezekiel represent? The Son of Man. As he comes to give warning to the house of Judah and the house of Israel when he's here as the Son of Man for 40 days, warning about the coming sword, being the water of life, who is the Son of Man, leading a troop of people. And who would he be leading? The priestly line, this Kohath group. What did this just say about the Kohath group? It now runs through the Gentiles. It runs through Christians. Interesting how that works, right? Do you guys remember this? If we go to Acts chapter 15, listen to this. Uh, where are we? Acts chapter 15. For those that don't know this, if we go to our chapters to years, okay, this is called chapters to years. These books, Hosea, Zechariah, John, Acts, Ezekiel, Psalms, Genesis, Hebrew, Exodus, and Judges. All of these chapters have prophetic insight, sometimes the entire chapter, sometimes verses within it that are all prophetic insights into the end of days. And they all relate 14 years. Hosea and Zechariah each had 14 chapters. The only two books in the whole Bible with 14 chapters. You don't think that the chapters and verses were, were established by the Lord and led by the writers through the Holy Ghost? They were just as much as their written words were. And we've done it with John. And you see, the book of Acts, 28 chapters, it plays out in two forms. So what do we know happens in chapter 15? The tribulation is now, is now essentially starting. And during the above, during this 50 days, we know there was a remnant group. They were part of the pre-trib, Gentile Luke, bride of Christ, that were to go pre-trib into the third heaven in the lowest room to the wedding. But they were chosen before going. They were instructed that they would remain and be servants of the Lord when he returns from the wedding and he will come and knock and receive them. So let's prove this out. We saw um, uh, uh, right here. We just saw in, in the chart here how now the Christians have this priesthood, okay? And the priesthood, we know, are the remnant workers. How do we know they're the remnant workers? We know them from uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, of course, which is the, the church of Smyrna. They're the ones who put their necks on the line, won't be hurt by the second death. And we see them in Revelation 20, those who had put their necks on the line, never took the mark and all of those things, and they're part of the first resurrection. Everybody else, only these guys, all of the ancient Jews that were promised their millennial reign, they'll come back. But the only group being resurrected for the millennial reign are the remnant workers, are the ones who put their necks on the line. And I, I've said it before, I would even suspect that even all of those since Christ, like all of those disciples and everybody who for Christ, spirit-filled in Christ, put their necks on the line, I believe they will probably also be resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. That's who that group is. And we know that they're Gentiles. This is what Rome, uh, Acts chapter 15 is telling us. Listen to what it says. Uh, let's go, let's start in verse, 15, in verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost. So this, this is showing us, this is just like the chapters to years, okay? This is now when everything's starting and they receive the Holy Ghost. Um, even... As he did unto us. Remember, he's an apostle. The apostles received it at the beginning of the 50 days. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Wait a second. The disciples? Wasn't he just talking about the Gentiles? Exactly. These disciples were Gentiles. Okay? Um, upon the neck of the Gentiles, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
we shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles, the disciples. Uh, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God, uh, uh, God had brought among the Gentiles by them. You see, they, them, the, the Gentiles, the disciples, the disciples are this priestly line being spoken about this. It's not everybody, not everybody who's a Christian in Christ spirit filled is a priestly line. Was was every Israelite that believed a priest? No, of course not. That's not how it works. But there are chosen from among them. That, that are chosen for the Father, that he says, these are mine from among them. Remember, he had to go and choose them from among the tribes? That's what's going on. And until the time of the Gentiles is over, which is seals, which is the end of seals, then every priestly line worker is a Gentile Christian. And you noticed how you follow this line and there's your Kohath going down through these guys. And what do we know about Moses and Aaron? Well, they're working during seals. They're working until the time of the end of seals. We know the Aaron type is really, you know, Christ is coming at the end of seals as Messiah ben Ephraim, right? The Messiah ben Joseph, who is the greater high priestly king like Melchizedek than Aaron was. But we know Moses is also a typology of John, as is um, uh, Elijah. So we've got John the Baptist who is an Elijah type, but he's also a Moses type. And people say, well, how could that be? Well, in fact, I would say the scriptures tell us he was Elijah, but we also know it's a future prophetic Elijah. Because when you look even at the things that John the Baptist did, and we were told that he was Elijah, Elijah wasn't, uh, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind never having tasted of death. John was beheaded when Christ showed up and then everything was set and then, you know, about one year later, then John was beheaded. That's a big difference. And what do we see the connection? What have we taught and understood the connection is in this in the end of days? Well, we know that the John the Baptist type, the Elijah Moses types, they're going to be working during seals. But, when the Lord comes, the John the Baptist type will have already been beheaded. What do we know happens during seals? There's going to be those priestly line workers who put their necks on the line and will be beheaded. But we see in second uh, uh, in Revelation chapter two with the church of Smyrna, some of them shall be shall be killed. So what would the other what would the ones not being killed be like? They would be like the Elijahs. They'll be part having brought in the great multitude rapture of those still alive. What, what do we see with John the Baptist having died? And it's when the Lord's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion and the great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year of seals. What do we know prophetically in the was that took place? Well, we had Moses, but Moses couldn't cross over into the promised land. Moses ends up dying, and then Joshua, Yeshua, takes them over, right? Takes them over the Red Sea and crosses them into the land of their promise. Joshua, Yeshua. So you could see that Moses is actually uh, quite the prophetic picture in the end of days um, as, a, as, a, uh, as a Moses with John the Baptist. But at the same time, we know scripture tells us he's an Elijah type and that Elijah type is significant for those that don't end up dying during the time of seals. So it's interesting that in the transfiguration, you see Moses and you see Elijah. Essentially, both of them are a type of John. The ones working during the time of seals. OK, so look at what we see as we're seeing this, knowing that now from Christ forward it's to the christians we know it's not every single christian but that there's a group chosen from among those christians and a connection to one who's coming from among them 
is going to be the son of man who's coming. The one who is the white horse rider before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is the red horse rider. And look at where they are. The Kohites. This is exactly what we've been teaching. The one relating to the man of the four messiahs, the one relating to the man. And look who's there. Simeon. So Simeon is also part of this group when this remnant worker group is being chosen. And let's now see the rest of this story from Acts chapter 15, which is a prophetic picture at the end of the 50 days. The disciples had witnessed the miracles in Acts chapter 1. They had followed the Lord for 40 days. He called them his witnesses. And it was the two on the road to Emmaus, if you recall. The apostles received the anointing at the beginning of the 50 days. The disciples, who we see are Gentiles, received their anointing at the end on uh, Pentecost, at the end of 50 days. And then look at what it says. Acts 15, verse 14. Simeon, who? Simeon, right here. Just so happens, he's right in the mix of them. We see Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. <laughs> you see, if, you, if you've been around and you understand where these things are in the chapters to years like this right here, and he's saying, hey, remember that Simeon told us God came and did visit the Gentiles first? That's a prophetic language there of the pre-trib that he came at, which is directly connected even to Luke in order in, in Luke chapter 1, when God did visit. Now listen to what it says. Uh, the, uh, da, 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 how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Okay? So what are we seeing in this? One, yes, it's a prophetic picture of the Lord and having taken out the pre-trib, but what else is it? It's what I was just talking about. That a portion of them are gods. Right? They belong to God the Father. They are his priestly line of the Gentiles because it'll still be the Gentile age during the time of seals. And to this agree, the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, will I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. Well, how about that? Isn't that exactly what we know happens when he's going to return again at the end of seals? And then here for the first half of trumpets, it's the rebuilding of the city, the streets, and the temple. <clears throat> but the great thing is, is what? Is following the Kohath, following it through the priestly line. We know it was the Zadok line, even to the time of Christ, right? The, the, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we follow it through, we follow it through, and it goes into the Christians today. Christians who? The Gentiles. To which Simeon just said, to which Simeon said there would be the Gentile line right here. What is this? The Son of Man time. The Son of Man, the 40 days of the Son of Man, when he's with that priestly line. Remember them? In Luke chapter 24, we see here this the, the two that were on the road to Emmaus. And the two on the road to Emmaus, then he says, you know, he sits and eats with them, as we know, when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day. He's going to open unto them their understanding with the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their understanding. He then says, you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. What do he say? Bear them witness. Who? The Gentiles. Who? The disciples. That God visited at the beginning. To take for a people for his name, for himself. Yes, a pre-trib Gentile bride for himself, but also a remnant group, as we've been teaching forever, who are the Smyrna, Luke 24, remnant group. Then we know, of course, of Ezekiel chapter 21. Ezekiel in chapter 21, this is something we had taught on a number of times over the past few years. But in Ezekiel chapter 21, we're now seeing this warning over Jerusalem. And what's the Lord warning over? The drawing of the sword coming to them. 
the drawing of the sword. This is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. He's warning of the red horse rider. If he's warning of the red horse rider, <clears throat> and he's called the son of man, he's a priestly line, who do you think it is? The son of man is the white horse rider. And the reason he has a crown that's given to him, as we've taught, is because he just had his wedding, and at that Gentile wedding that he had, his mother gave him a crown, as we read in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, the last few verses. <coughs> and so this is his coming back from the wedding on the eighth day when he will begin his 40 days. And what is he doing? He's warning as a prophet, as the son of man. And he's warning about what? The great sword that's coming. Again, when we go into the discourses, this is why you see when you go Luke, Mark, Matthew, in Luke it says, you know, it'll be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and all these things. But he says, but he said unto them. And then in verse 12 of Luke 21, he says, but before all these. Well, what comes before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom? which is the great sword being furbished and given. The white horse rider. So who's the one as the son of man warning as the white horse rider that the sword's coming? Pretty obvious, right? And so we've shared this uh, a few times over the years, and we see it right here. He's all warning about the furbishing of the sword. It's coming. He's, it's about to be given into the hands of the slayer. Into the hands of the slayer. Okay, this is the attack that's compassing about and the destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me, that'll start at the end of those 50 days. The pre-trib happens, the seven-day wedding, the Lord returns on the eighth day, which is the beginning of the 40 days. At the end of 40, what has he been doing during those 40? Well, we know he's been warning us Jonah, right? And what was Jonah? It said in Luke 11, starting verse 29, and when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, a lot of people right now are looking to this uh, April 8th sign and believe it's the sign of Jonah the prophet. It may be a sign, but what you guys must remember is most people are reading that from the Gospel of Matthew because they've never understood Luke's. You see, when you go to the sign of Jonah in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that's the one where it becomes obvious in the contradictions like I was talking about in the beginning once you understand the differences in the Gospels. This is how you know this is prophecy that was yet to be fulfilled. Jesus is coming as Jonah the prophet to warn for 40 days as Jonah did to Nineveh, the Lord is coming as the Son of Man to warn for 40 days. Do I hope it's connected to, to Nisan 1? Absolutely I do. Do I believe it is? No. You guys know where I believe it is. It, I think it's crystal clear. And so do, do I take this sign for granted? No. It's a warning. It's getting people to pay attention. There might be some catastrophic earthquake or something to help wake the people up. You've then got all of these cicadas and all of this craziness. It's to warn and to wake up the people. But we know the Lord is coming as the son of man, as Jonah the prophet, who's going to be here for 40 days, which is directly related to Ezekiel, uh, to Ezekiel who is a priest who is coming to warn where they will know that a prophet has been among them in that rebellious house. They won't be able to deny anymore. They will know that they've been in the midst of a prophet. All of these things, this is why it's so exciting for me, because all of it is directly related to here. We had Simeon. Let me show you this. We saw how Simeon, on a little side note on this, we saw how Simeon was here directly relating to the disciples as the Gentiles who are the, the, the priestly line workers 
who were told this was going to happen by Simeon, for which if you go into Acts, cha uh, is it, yeah, Acts chapter 2, at the anointing of the Holy Ghost, wait, was it Acts chapter 2? No, no, in Luke chapter 2, remember Luke in order, for those that don't know, there's a video in order, one, two, three, four. We know this is the pre-trib. Watch what happens here. Look at this, this little side note as well. In Luke in order, we know it relates to the pre-trib. Then we see, okay, and the pre-trib is like this John the Baptist birth, and then it's the eighth day of his circumcision. On the eighth day of his circumcision, which is the picture going into Luke chapter 2 and the 40 days beginning, look what happens. In Luke 1, 68, Blessed be the Lord of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Huh. What did we just read in the same corresponding typology? That the Lord had visited. Remember how Simeon said that he would come and, and, and visited and took out a people for his name? It's the same connection. Now watch what happens. So this is what, from, the, from the, the typology in John's birth, we see is a picture of the pre-trib. We see the circumcision as the Lord returning on the eighth day. He's going to then choose that group of people, that disciple remnant workers, which is the house of Smyrna, the two on the road to Emmaus. They represent what Simeon was saying, that God chose a people for himself. And look what happens. Here's the picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man connected to his birth. And what do we read? In Luke 2, 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Um, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Crazy, right? There's your Simeon in a 40-day scripture of Luke in the prophetic end-time understanding as the 40 days of the Son of Man. And Simeon is referring to them after the 50 days are over. At the end of the 50, is referring, saying, remember how Simeon told us that God was... Yes, he took out a group in the pre-trib, but that he was taking out a group from among the Gentiles to be his priestly line of disciples. It's all right there. It's the same story. It's so exciting to see it. Over and over and over. <coughs> all right. So that's really the, the side note stuff. And the reason I say side note stuff is because when I went into Ezekiel, that wasn't my purpose for going into Ezekiel. But we've done some studies. We've looked at things over the years with Ezekiel. And and um, I hadn't touched on them for a little bit. But then seeing, I hadn't realized either that Ezekiel was also a priest. So to be able to understand that and to follow the lineage that he came through. And to see that this lineage was connected to the whole Kohath and Simeon was there. And it was related now to the Gentiles, to the Zadoks, which then leads into the Gentiles. And here we are, a group of people at the end of days that we've been talking about for a few years, knowing we're being prepared in the revelation of the Lord. And what are we? A bunch of Gentiles. You see how clear it becomes? There is a Gentile priestly line of remnant workers they come through the kohath line and they're related to those who are here with the lord for 40 days and remain to work during seals <coughs> it's exciting to see guys and i just wanted to share that with you as as some added uh some added ammo now we're going to listen to this this one here is uh, we're just going to listen, I think, the, what is this, maybe one minute of this one, and then we're going to chat on some parts, and we're going to go to another section. Listen to what he says here. Okay, again, he, he's, he's a rabbi, I'm sure, but I believe he's messianic. I never went in to look. 
And he may not be messianic, but he certainly goes into the New Testament and has read it and understood it as well. So listen to what he says. And it may also be in Pasuka Rabati, although sometimes Pasuka Rabati and Yalkut Shimoni have um, overlapping Give it a second. traditions. Um, that it says, in the, and we'll get to this as we go in further chapters, but it says the head of Persia will frighten the entire world and cause destruction to the entire world, speaking of Iran. And all the nations will go, what is going to happen? What do we do? And even Israel will be afraid and they'll become very scared and they'll say, where shall we go? Oh, you hear that? Right off the bat. Even Persia, right? Iran will come and will attack and, and the world will be on edge. <clears throat> and the Jews will even say, oh my goodness, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What do we know, guys? What do we know about when that happens? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. If we've understood the year is 2024 that this happens, we know that this is the beginning of the 50 days, okay? On the 9th of Av. We've revealed that we've gone through it. We know this. We've broken it down so much. We know it equals the 9th of Av. It's not directly related to Jesus' birthday, but it's 40 days, uh, uh, sorry, two months after his birthday. We've proven all of it out. So it relates to the 9th of Av, okay? So if this is the year that it happens, what have we been teaching? What have we been teaching now for a few years, and especially over the last three? We know that northern Israel, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be attacked first. And in the past year, we've had the Isaiah 9 confirming it, that her vexation, the first is a light affliction in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, which is, of course, what Jesus fulfilled when he walked in in Matthew chapter 4, which is where we got the confirmation that it was two months later, which led us to the count from uh, um, the ninth of Av. And what is this first attack? This first attack is the attack by Iran. This is why we say this, this war that they're in right now isn't going to stop. Netanyahu isn't going to stop. And even though Hamas is nearly done, they're not going to be nearly done. They're going to make sure they're finished. And this is going to continue, and they're going to turn their attention more towards Iran, to the north and to Iran. But Iran is going to attack. And that's what he's saying. He gets it. He knows Iran is going to attack when the end of days come. And look what happens when Iran attacks. When, what has happened? The pre-trib has happened. August 12th, right? Depending where you live on the world, Give or take August 12th. And the 9th of Av is the attack. <clears throat> and while the people are panicking, as he said, and where are we going to go? And the world is, is caught off guard because Haifa and Tel Aviv have just been attacked and are decimated. A war, a short war breaks out in the Middle East. And what did he say that their scriptures tell them? That they're going to be panicking. The world is going to be panicking, but so are Israelis. Oh my goodness, this is the end. What are we going to do? Here's where that attack with Iran is. And he said, oh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Listen to what he says now. Go, where shall we go? What do we do? At that moment, Mashiach appears and he tells Israel, my children, everything I have done, I have done for you. Do not be afraid. Lift up your heads. For your, how does it say? Lift, does it say Listen. Lift up your heads. It says, Our redemption draws nigh. your redemption has arrived. Yeah. It says that in Yalkut Shimoni. It says, do not be afraid for your redemption has arrived. So it is the part. Do not be afraid. So <clears throat> what have we been teaching? Here comes the attack on Iran. The people are in freak out. They're in chaos. They're wondering where they're going to go, where they're going to flee. And then he says, the son of man, uh, uh, Messiah, is going to show up in their kuchamoni or whatever their writings are. And it says in those writings. Lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. <laughs> for those of you who have been following for a little bit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not He, he wasn't talking, oh, he'll make a relation to Matthew and Luke. But he says, the uh, accoutrement or whoever that is, that writing, says that then Messiah will show up and will say that everything that I have done, I have done for you. When is he showing up? After the attack from Iran, when the world starts to get a bit chaotic and, and everybody's starting to panic, 
And everybody, of course, in, in Israel is saying, what are we going to do? Oh, Messiah, Lord, what are we going to do? And then what does he do? Shows up in the midst of them. Everything that I've done, I've done for you. Do you guys remember? Those of you who have been around for a bit, you know what I'm talking about. Because we've showed that the Dajjal. So what the Muslims call the Dajjal, they, they try to tell the world that the Dajjal is the Christian Antichrist. But we know he's not the Christian Antichrist. He is Messiah, the Son of Man, who's coming for 40 days as the prophet. As the prophet Jonah. He's going to fulfill the four messiahs. That's the first one. And when he does, and he comes as the Son of Man, the, it, it says that he's coming for 40 days, even their Dajjal guy. So... All Christians know that there is no Antichrist coming for only 40 days, but the world is going to believe that this is the Antichrist. Because all Christians have been told that the Antichrist comes first. Because they're learning from Matthew. They've been told that Messiah doesn't come until he returns at the very end. So they have no understanding that he's coming for 40 days, which is why in Luke 17, watch this one. Which is why when we go to Luke 17, listen to what it says. We get a whole picture of the end here. About the coming of the kingdom. If we go down to uh, verse 24, Luke 17, he's going to come as lightning from one end unto the other. But that's going to be when he comes in his day, singular, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Then he says, but first... This but first is the same as we've taught in the past as Luke 20 uh, as Luke 21 when the 40 days of the son of man begins before the red horse rider and what does he say but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation He's going to be rejected for 40 days and these 40 days are the 40 days of the son of man to the point until they got into the ark and the 40 days began This is it right here this is a picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man when he's here as Jonah. When he's here as the, the Ezekiel type. He's going to be rejected. Because nobody on earth believes that the Son of Man or understands that the Son of Man is coming first to warn as Jonah did and as he said he would like Jonah to this generation, which means the final generation. But do you know what their, what their writings said uh, um, about the Dajjal in the Muslim writings? It said that the only people that will really come to him will be like prostitutes and, and homeless people and Jews. Doesn't it make sense? You see, is it all because they're going to believe this is the Messiah and it's the time of the end? No, we know that he's going to be rejected. He's going to be rejected by the world. And of course, he's going to be rejected by some Jews as well. But there are Jews who are aware in the writings that when Iran attacks and they're in the midst of chaos and the world is saying, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? They have writings where they're expecting Messiah to show up. How about that? You've got you've got the Arabs, uh, the the Muslims, and you've got their writings that says there is a guy coming for 40 days who's going to really be your Antichrist, which he's not. And when he comes, it'll be mostly those 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 uh, uh, pig Jews, they would say, that are going to be the ones. You see that are going to believe on him. Of course, because their writings are telling them, but the Christians keep telling the church Lord isn't coming again till he returns feet down. But guess what? The Lord knew it the whole time. He knew it for 2,000 years. Here it is in his words right here. But first must I be rejected for what? The 40 days is the 40 days of Noah. Right there. It's awesome. Not awesome that he's going to be rejected, but it's awesome to understand the revelation of Scripture. So what else does this relate to? It relates to Luke 21 as well, right? <clears throat> Did you, you remember what he said, right? Watch this. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Let's go use our trusted e-sword. So he just said 
that in their writings, when the Son of Man comes after Iran has attacked, do you understand how powerful that is? I still, I still, uh, when I heard it, I was like, what? They have it. When Iran attacks and they're in chaos and they're wondering what to do and the world is in a panic, then Messiah shows up. Then Messiah shows up. And in their writings, it says when he shows up, he's going to say, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Well, isn't that interesting? Because what do we know about that? Luke 21, 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the power powers of heaven shall be shaken. What do we know about that? Well, we also know there's going to be a meteor coming through or meteor breakup and stuff coming through. That's another part of it. But when do we also teach that this is going to take place? It's going to take place during this same seven-day period. Israel attacked in the north. Haifa and Tel Aviv destroyed a short north, uh, Middle Eastern war and the people in a panic over it. The meteor, the stones throw coming through. And then what does it say? What's, what's the next verse then say? And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, okay? In a singular cloud with power and glory great glory now listen to this and when these things begin to come to pass then lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh when these things begin to come to pass then lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh pretty interesting right that's exactly what he said they would be crying out in their writings that it would be what they would be crying out in... I was just looking at something here, checking something out. That this is what they would be crying out in their writings, and this is connected to Luke 21. Now, here's the thing with it and why I bring it up. Because I have wondered for a long time if this redemption draweth nigh, is this really about the pre-trib coming of the Son of Man? Now, it absolutely is the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days. But is it actually the pre-trib? This is something I've wondered and bounced back and forth on for years. Because sometimes I read it and I think, oh, okay, well, this is the one related to the pre-trib. But... I don't believe it is. And now that I hear what they're saying, that Israel is going to be attacked, and then they're going to be crying out for Messiah, and Messiah is going to show up, and these are in their writings that when he shows up, this is going to happen? This is what they're going to be saying? This tells me and leads me now more that what we're reading there is not the Lord coming for the pre-trib, but when the Lord comes on the eighth day after the wedding. Here's why I say that. In Luke 21, even 34, 35, but 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I don't believe there's any need or reason that the Son of Man is coming down in a single cloud to then take the pre-trib group and go back up in that cloud. I've wondered if that was possible in the past, but I don't think that's the case. I believe the pre-trib is when the moment comes, I believe around August 12th, bang, that's the vanishing. And so now based on what we're reading and what they have in their scriptures, it would seem that this redemption that draweth nigh when they look up and see these things beginning to come to pass, that this redemption that's drawing nigh, I believe, is the Son of Man coming to begin his 40 days. They just help bring clarity to that, you see? Because if it's after the attack on Iran, and they're crying out now, 
we know that the attack on Iran happens after the pre-trip. So why would they have their, their verses with the Son of Man coming that they would have Messiah there and it be him talking to them and here it is right here. And there's a, another reason why I say that. When we go into the discourses of Mark and Matthew, you see, in Mark, which we know this with the um, coming of the Son of Man, we know this is the end of the sixth seal. And it says, uh, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory and so forth, right? This is when they're going to see him coming in the clouds, plural. Is, is he taking a group and then leaving? No. He's coming with paradise. He's coming with the place prepared. And he's receiving them unto himself in paradise, just like he said in John chapter 14, which lo and behold is the equivalent in chapters to years to the seventh year of seal. Of seals. So, again, he's not leaving. This is the, this is him coming. So why would they why would there be a group of people seeing him in Luke coming in a cloud? And the Jews have ancient writings when when they look up and the redemption draws nigh. Wouldn't that redemption drawing nigh be also this connection to the remnant workers? Remember what happens that he's going to warn them before he takes the pre-trip? They're to be ready when he returns from the wedding in Luke chapter 12 about verse 35, 36. And then when he returns, we know it's the eighth day, like John's circumcision time. And we know from 1 Peter 1 that when that happens, because they're in the presence of the Lord, that they will have faith no more because they will then be in the presence. That'll be what? They will have received their redemption. And the Jews knowing and recognizing that it's Messiah because of their ancient writings and the Muslim writings saying that the Jews are going to recognize this guy even though he's going to be the enemy, which they think he's the enemy, but he is going to be the Messiah. And so while he's there warning as Jonah, as in Ezekiel, they will heed these warnings. What will most of the church do? Most of the church will ignore it because they're going to be in dispute whether this is the Antichrist because they've never been taught ever that Messiah comes first. And the Jews have been told when this happens with Iran, and they're freaking out, that Messiah will come. And we know that he's coming for 40 days as Jonah, and when he does, he's going to warn them to flee to the mountains, just like Luke 21 says, just as confirmed in Luke 19 when he weeps over Jerusalem. And when you read it in Luke 19, you know that he's actually, uh, uh, or you know that not everybody's going to believe, of course. But there will be those who are prepared, like this, like this rabbi, and those who understand those teachings. When you go to Matthew, you have the same storyline. <clears throat> you see him coming on the clouds in Matthew 24. You see, uh, where is it? Da -da -da -da. There it is, in Matthew 24, 27. So when we saw in Luke 17, verse 24, 25, it starts with, he's saying it'll be as lightning from one end to the other when I come in my day. And then he says, but before this, okay? The but before, of course, goes back to the Luke when he starts his 40 days. Which would make sense that Luke chapter 21 is not about the pre-trib outside of the verse 36 that the rest of the world will be caught off guard, but everybody who is in Christ praying, watching, they'll escape all these things. And then the imagery of him coming in verse 28 is when he's coming for his 40 days. And so when we see here in Luke 20, uh, in Matthew 24, 27, we're seeing the same wording from Luke 17, uh, about 24, 25, when he's talking about when he's coming in his day. Funny that you don't see him coming as lightning from one end unto the other in Luke's discourse. You don't see it in Mark's discourse. You only see it in Matthew's discourse. Because this is him coming in his day as lightning from one end unto the other. And we're going to get into this here in verse 28 in a moment, where it says, For wheresoever the carcass is, 
there will the eagles be gathered there will the eagles be gathered did you see this in luke's discourse nope did you read about it in mark's discourse nope in fact even where you find this in scripture which is only four times is also very revealing but in fact there's a fifth place as well how about that right so what do we see here we'll get to that so in verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days you see this is the lord returning feet down on the mount of olives at the end of 13 years and now he's here for the 14th so when his ministry when he was told with with uh was it ray that It'll be 14 years about a year ago. That leaves about 13 years. And guess what? That's 2024. 13 years left to the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. And there shall appear a sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So what do you have many Christians saying right now? They go to Matthew 24, verse 30, and they say, see, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. This is the sign of Jonah that we're looking for now in, in the eclipse. No, it's not. This is the end of tribulation. And all you got to read is verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days. So again, I am not saying it's not maybe an event and it's not a warning and a preparation. Absolutely. But is it Matthew 24? Absolutely not. Not even close not even close at all and that's an important distinction to understand okay and then what do we see uh then shall they see the sign of the uh, the son of man coming in nope this one's on the clouds because that will be when he's seen from one end of heaven unto the other as lightning you see it's all there guys and so when we've gone through this and we've shared this 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 was something that like I said, it, it wasn't a, a big deal for me because we know that it's really just a difference of, you know, s the seven day wedding to the eighth day. But I had often, often wondered if this if this looking up really was pre trib or the coming of the son of man to start his 40 days. And now I am of the the understanding. I'm of the belief that this is stuff that happens, you know, in that latter portion within that seven-day week, maybe even more so as he's coming, because it says, when you see these things coming, right, then lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. So, you know, it, it was easy to say in the past, you know, is this is this because we're going to see the stone's throw coming and then we're to look up and as we see it coming, we know that it's at hand and that might be our warning that, bang, here we're about to go. Maybe. But it doesn't mean it's falling yet, right? But we might see it. But according to everything else, it seems much more likely that it's the start of his 40 days. Because then he's remaining. He's remaining for his 40 days. In Mark, at the end of six years of seals, he's coming in the clouds, plural, this time. And he's remaining at the end of the sixth year of seals for a bit, right? For several years. And then again, at the end of trumpets, He's, he's now returning feet down on, on the Mount of Olives on the clouds. So now it starts to make a lot more sense to me that it relates to his uh, to his coming for his 40 days and the Dajjal writing that the Jews, that some Jews will come to him and that there are rabbis like this out there teaching that in fact they know at that point after Iran that they should expect their Messiah coming. And who's he coming as? He's coming as Jonah the prophet to warn for 40 days. Okay? Very, very interesting stuff. So let's now keep going. Let's take this a step further. Because now this is going to get pretty wild. So you'll remember, again, now we're going into the, uh, um, the, the Leviathan Bohemoth conversation. We've had the Leviathan Bohemoth conversation, but somebody had posted to me or commented that that we don't understand. Hey, you're missing the third character, the the third creature that's coming. 
And I said, well, no, we, we haven't missed the third creature. The third creature is, of course, Satan. Okay? So if the third creature is Satan, there, there's also a name for him. And when this person had commented on it, I just thought, okay, well, it's okay. We already understand what that is and, you know, no big deal. And then I watched this video and see what I'm telling you. Again, the, there's this, this connection, this, this grouping of things that bring more clarity in this one little piece here of about two minutes and change where both of these things are covered. And they're directly connected, yet at the same time, there's a separation. There's two things. So you'll understand as, as I go through this. Let, let's have a listen. Uh, we, uh, we'll have a, a few minutes for any questions anybody has. It says, Revelation 8.13, I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let me pause it there for a moment. He just said, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, Listen to what he says. He says, And I beheld and heard an eagle flying through heaven, flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, whoa, 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 wait a second. He didn't say eagle. It says angel. There, there's a big difference between eagle and angel, you see? A messenger. You see? An angel, a messenger. Clearly not eagle. Let's see what he has to say next. For those who dwell on the earth, because of the other voices of the shofar, the other sounds of the shofar, of the three angels who are yet to sound, who are yet to blast it. Okay? So, let's just talk first of all an eagle. What on earth is this? Mm. An mine, eagle. Mine says angel, but in Yours my, says angel. Mine says angel, but in my <coughs> center it also says eagle as well. So, <coughs> let's, let's go into that. Watch what he does. Here. So let me, let me tell you one of the best places to go to is blueletterbible.org. Have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. So Blue Letter Bible is incredible if you know how to use it, all right? So I'm going to just go up here to the search bar. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 8, go down to verse 13. I'm going to go interlinear, and it, it breaks down every Greek word, and it matches it all up, all right? So the word there for angel is, or, or eagle. Well, this particular passage is angelos, in which case it would be an angel. Um, I think you may, we may have a manuscript um, variant here. <laughs> I think we might have a manuscript variant here, right? Let me show you why. He reads from his manuscript, and it says eagle, the other guy says, well, wait a second, you know, mine, mine says angel, but it says something about eagle here as well. And so he's going through it, and he's trying to understand, wait a second, what's happening here? <clears throat> and when he goes to pull it up, he pulls up Revelation chapter 8, and he says, Blue Letter Bible, which is awesome, which it is, here he is, you know, because King James, right? We use KJV. I mean, see right here, KJV. And he says, go to the interlinear. All you do is like go to right here and you can click on it like that. And it goes to the interlinear and he's going through the Greek word translations and he says, no, angelos, right? Angel, there, there's no, you can't be, be caught off guard. You can't be in a, in a contradictory between angel and eagle. They're, they're, they're two different words. It's not They're not even the same. So is it angel or is it eagle? Okay? This is what he's getting at. And he says, so see, now there's this difference within the scriptures here in these different manuscripts. So I start doing a little bit more research because my first reaction was like his as well. Oh, well, you know, I went and looked and no, it's clearly an eagle. And even the interlinear is eagle. But then they start having a bit of a conversation. I thought, well, I'm going to go look at this because this was something I was just shared about. And then the person couldn't find anything. And when I looked briefly, I didn't spend a lot of time, but I was like, OK, well, I guess that's not what it is. And I let it be. And then I went to go look at it. Does an angel or eagle fly in Revelation 8, 13? 
in the new KJV and in the KJV, everywhere says angel. But in the NIV, and NIV is garbage, but it has eagle. And this started to get very interesting. And what you start to re realize, I mean, the difference between eagle and angel is, is very different. But he just said that there's a variation between some of these manuscripts. So if there's a variation between these manuscripts, maybe we can find out if this, this is true. Let's, let's just see if maybe this is one of those things where the KJV just, they, you know, it could relate to an angel, maybe an eagle. What if it's a, an angel that is an eagle? You'll see what I'm getting at. And then it would make more sense. You know, here's another great example of, of, a, of a difference within the KJV. Okay? And this one's much more subtle, but it is so, so powerful. You guys remember this, right? This is from Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, we'll just go right to it in verse 8. Behold, and again, KJV. Behold, I bring them from the north, I, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth together, a great company. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And and why do I share this one? You'll, you'll see what I'm getting at. Those of you that have been around for a bit, you'll know it. Okay, a great company. What does this mean? A great multitude. When you understand this is the rapture right here. This is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. That's what's going on here. Listen to verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim is my firstborn. Ah, here we go. There's your Ephraim firstborn. And Ephraim the firstborn is related to the ox, the bull. Remember, the olive branch. Why is the olive branch important? Because at the great multitude rapture, we can go to the story of Noah in the picture of the big picture that Noah gives us. And we see that in chapter 8, after seven days, Right after that first seven days in chapter eight, and it says the olive branch, the, the the dove plucked it off, plucked off the olive branch, and it was in its mouth. Yeah, there it is right there, because it's the time of the rapture. When Messiah ben Joseph, the, the firstborn Ephraim, Messiah ben Ephraim comes. And who's he gonna destroy? He's gonna destroy the wolf who was the Antichrist. I'm not saying Benjamin is the Antichrist, but in relation to the wordings of their meanings. This is when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's coming to represent the ox. What do we know happens to the ox? The ox is going to get sacrificed, right? And it's going to be for the priestly line. All of these things. And Ephraim relates to the ox, okay? Well, what do we see? Again, there he is. And what was my point in this is this is talking about the great mid-trib, great multitude, like Revelation chapter 7. You want to know why it's so powerful when we do some digging, when the Spirit leads and people send you things and you spend some time in them? Here it is. If you go into the Septuagint, the original translation into from English, I mean, from, what was it, from the Greek, the Septuagint of Jeremiah 20, uh, 38, verse 8 says, Behold, I bring them from the north and will gather them from one end of the earth Listen to this. To the feast of the Passover. And the people shall beget a great multitude, and they shall return thither. At the feast of Passover. Those of you who have been around for a bit, you know exactly why that is so powerful and so important. Because the great multitude rapture of Mark in his discourse, <clears throat> the great multitude rapture, doesn't go when they see at the end of the sixth year of seals. They're not going right away when they see the Lord coming 
with heavenly Mount Zion and at the end of the sixth seal and everybody's crying out and freaking out. They don't go right away because the 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets and at the end of six years, the Lord's coming at the Feast of Trumpets. The day and hour, no one knows. That's when he's coming in the clouds of Mark's discourse. But that's not when the rapture is. They don't know when their time is going to be. We do. We know it relates to Passover, either first or most likely second Passover of that seventh year. So about the midst of the seventh year of seals is when the great multitude rapture comes in. We had understood this through the harvests of the wheat and when the wheat gets observed. And then we find out that in the Septuagint, it's telling you that the great multitude rapture is going to happen at Passover. You see, this is perfect for the type of thing going on right now in the world of the Watchman community. Because remember what I said in the beginning? When you go to understand the, the, the differences in the Gospels and the 14 years, and, and it's all because of Matthew, because everybody goes to Matthew 24 because they don't understand Mark and they don't understand Luke. So what is everybody expecting with this great eclipse that's coming? They're thinking the rapture is about to happen, and it would make sense that it's going to be around the time of Passover. Do you know why they think that? Because their perspective is Matthew. So if their perspective is Matthew and everybody's going pre-trib, then they're in Revelation chapter 7, waiting for the great multitude rapture, which will happen at Passover. But not this year. Hello. The pre-trib is connected to the 12th of August, right at the time of the true seventh Sabbath, to the first fruits of the wheat harvest. <coughs> Excuse me, from winter wheat. And this begins the 50 days to the end of the year, right here with the anointing of Acts 2.0, and then on the day and hour, no one knows, the 14 years begin, and that's the attack, excuse me, by Syria. Okay, again, I know we've shared on that, right? So this was, this was so powerful. I remember when we first came across it, the sister that shared it with us, and I was just blown away. Because, again, I'm going to go with the little rabbit trail for the newcomers. Because... What do we know about it? We know that Deuteronomy 16 tells us seven days for the bread of affliction of unleavened bread, right? Which is Passover. Then you've got the Feast of Weeks, which is a one day observation. And then you got the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is a seven day observation. And then an eighth day. Seven, one, seven. It begins with the one. Then it's the seven years of seals as the bread of affliction. And look at it's six days. And on the seventh day is the solemn assembly. You see, in that seventh day, six days as six years of affliction, and the seventh day is the solemn assembly. That's your sixth to the seventh year of seals. And then seven years of trumpets, of trumpet judgments, as the seven days of tabernacles. And then what happens? It's seven days, and then the eighth day is called the new beginning. For those that don't know, here it is right here. There's your pre-trib uh, at feast of, uh, feast of Weeks. Then you've got your sixth to your seventh as days of unleavened bread for Passover. And then you've got your seven of trumpets as your seven days of tabernacles. And then the eighth day is the new beginning. And that is the final jubilee. It is the revelation of the mystery of 717 that so many people have desired to understand over the years. And we can prove what it means, right? When you go look up what the Hebrew 717 is, again, I'm going to stay on this little side note for a second. Look at what it says. The word is used twice. 717 in the Hebrew. 717, and it's what? To pluck, to gather, and pluck. What's the first one? The pre-trib gathering. What's the second one? The mid-trib great multitude pluck. What is the pluck? Like the olive branch plucked out when the Lord comes 
as the ox, as the Messiah ben from Messiah ben Joseph. There goes the olive branch. And why do you think it has Numbers 13 here? Look at that. Why do you think it also has Numbers 13? Because in Numbers 13, Moses changes Hosea or Osi's name, who is Hosea, to Joshua. Who is Joshua? The high priest and king. Yeshua Messiah coming as the ox. <clears throat> Told you, man. It just keeps going deeper and so awesome. All of these things, every piece connected. So what are we seeing? We're seeing something here that was in the original translation in from a Greek or English. And it has the Feast of Passover for us. Why doesn't the KJV? Why did the KJV just completely eliminate any feast being here at all? I don't know. It seems pretty prominent, like it's an actual feast. I don't know what the reasoning was for them not putting it in the KJV, but it's not in the KJV. And for prophetic purposes, this is an absolute chunk of gold. It confirms the revelation of the mid-trib great, great multitude rapture being in the midst of the seventh year of seals as we have taught for years. It's fantastic. So what does that then have to do with, with, with uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13? Well, let's go have a look at some of this. This is why I ended up in Ezekiel, just to make a point in looking into this, because in the, in the Greek, it said it was angel. But in these other references, or at least in that one reference, it says that it's eagle. Well, now, wait a second. Is it really just the KJV that, that went with angel instead of eagle? Well, instead of interlinear, let's go click on Bibles and let's see what it says. There's your KJV and your new KJV. An angel, an angel, but it's got a little footnote there. Now listen to the rest of them. NLT, then I looked and heard a single eagle. NIV, I watched and I heard an eagle. ESV, and I heard an eagle. C, uh, CSB, and I heard an eagle. NS, NASB 20, I heard an eagle flying. And whoa, an eagle flying. LSB, an eagle flying. NET, an eagle flying. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Why the KJV went with an angel. Clearly, the relation is to an eagle. And so to that brother who had shared that with me, you got it, brother. He found it on something else. Somebody else was sharing about it, and he wanted to share it with me. And I just thought, man, I couldn't find anything to, to support it. So I thought, I'm not so sure about it. And he couldn't find anything, so we, I let it be until this was shared with me. And he told me he went to look in the inner linear, and the inner linear contradicted what he was reading from. And then I thought, well, let's take it a step further. And here it is. Eagle, 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 essentially, except for the KJV. Had to be a reason for it. And so as I went into Ezekiel, and the reason I went into Ezekiel is, of course, we even see right here in Ezekiel 1.5, you know, this incredible, <laughs> the, what he sees, I mean, we, I don't even know that we can comprehend it. We can't comprehend what he's really seeing, right? People have tried to draw pictures and everything, but we can't really comprehend it. But it says in verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Okay? Their appearance, uh, uh, and this was their appearance, they had the likeness of a man. They had they they kind of looked like a man, but they were they had wings. Underneath their wings, you find out they have there there's like hands that are like human hands. And look at what verse 10 says. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. So what happens? All four of them have these faces. So their heads don't need to turn. So if I had, like, if you take this, 
rectangle, if you will, okay? Say this is a square. That would mean this face would be like the face, oh, let's put it down here. This would be the face of a man. This would be the face of an ox. This would be the face of the eagle. And this would be the face of the lion. And there's four of them. So you got one here, one here, one here, and one here. So if you're looking from this way down here, looking up, you're seeing a man, a man, a man, and a man. If you're looking from the right side of the screen, you're seeing a lion, a lion, a lion, and a lion. And they all move in their direction accordingly, but they have four faces. They don't have to turn their heads. That's what's being described. And of course, one is a man, one is a lion, one is an ox, and one is an eagle. When you place it, of course, to their alignment within the wilderness, there's your man, there's your ox, there's your eagle, there's your lion. Exactly as, as prophetically understood it would be. So what are they? Well, we just saw they were called four living creatures. So there's one point, right? They're four living creatures. Uh, there it is again, four living creatures, and it gives more description of them. Listen to this. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon their heads, okay, upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads. Okay? So we can see it. Verse 26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne, of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. Okay? So some people describe these, these um, uh, uh, the, the, the four living creatures as holding up the firmament over the earth. They're over the four corners holding it up, okay? And the, the dome is over them. So you're seeing it right here being described. But what are these four living creatures, right? We go to Revelation chapter 4, and we see the four living creatures described again, right? So we see it in Revelation chapter 4. We can go to starting in verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Well, if you go read more in Ezekiel, you see that they were all full of eyes, all on their wings, on the circles, uh, on all the sides of their heads, everything. Okay? So you're having that same description. And the first be beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast was like a man. And the fourth beast like a flying eagle. So again, now you've got a what? A flying eagle. When you see the description of it, we see this description, uh, the face of an eagle. When we see it in, in Revelation, as we just saw, we see it as a flying eagle. The other one was an eagle. This one is a flying eagle. When we go to Ezekiel chapter 10, now we find out what they are. And you'll see it right here in the description. Do you know that the Lord made it so obvious he used the word in the plural or single sense 20 times? 20 times in one chapter, he uses the word cherub or cherubim. In Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them, uh, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance and likeness of the throne. <clears throat> so we just saw. We know that the four living creatures are, of course, the cherubim. The cherubim, we know, surround the throne of Christ. Right? So we've understood this. So as we look forward and we dig into this, we go look at the four living creatures and do a little research on it. And you start digging around, listen to what they say about the four living creatures. In Judaism, the living beings that are considered angels. In Judaism, 
the living beings are considered angels of fire who hold up the throne of God. According to the Zohar, they hold up the firmament itself. Well, that's what we were just seeing, right? If the firmament and that firmament cover is there, they're the ones that are holding up the firmament. It's above their heads. And there are four of them. Do you know that the four are the ones on the four corners? Huh, whoa, 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 wait a second. The ones on the four corners? Let's go, let's go look into this. If we go to Revelation chapter 7, it says, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor anything. And I saw another angel ascending out of the east, having the seal of the living God. Uh, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels whom it was given to hurt not the sea and the earth till they had sealed the servants, right? We go into Revelation chapter 8, and now we see in verse 6 those angels. There are seven angels that have the seven trumpets. Well, you know there are seven archangels, right? But there are four main archangels. And it's believed, as it says here, one of the interpretations of it is that um, that they're, uh, uh, they are ranked first in uh, Mediana, what is that? Met Medundins? <laughs> there you go, that's all I'm getting. Uh, Jewish Anglican hierarchy. They have also been correlated with the four archangels. The four key ones who are Michael, who is the iron headed, uh, who is the iron headed, Raphael, the human headed, Uriel, the ox headed, and Gabriel, eagle headed. That kind of that rings some truth, right? Because who are they? They're four living creatures, and they're cherubim. Cherubim are a type of angelic being. We know they're a type of angelic being. They were they're around the throne of Christ. Remember one of those angelic beings that fell? Lucifer? So who is he? Look at this. This is just an interesting side note. I don't know if you guys have ever looked up the what references the four main um uh, uh, uh archangels, but when you go look them up. Uriel, who is ox-headed, is also the one who holds the scroll and, and has the wisdom of prophecy among the angel of fire. He represents, according to this, the ox-head. Do you remember the revelation that we received in Ministry Revealed of the ox of Taurus being the beginning, of Taurus being the start of the count, what it revealed in Taurus and the eye of Taurus. In fact, Uriel's color is related to as red and the bullseye of Taurus, that, that uh, um, Aldebaran star is, is, a, is a red bright star. It's recognized as being red called bullseye. And Uriel is connected to it and he's connected to prophecy and holding the scroll. Do you know that Uriel's name, check this out. I'm just sharing this as I find it a fascinating side note in relation to this ministry. You guys all know that I've been sharing about 222 that was in my life since I was about 12 or 13 and I recognized it. So much so that my son was even born, who was my firstborn, was born February 22nd, 222. And 222 means Uriel. The flame of God. What? I just, that's, a, that's just a little side note for myself that I just thought was pretty fascinating. That Uriel, who is 222, the number that had been appearing around throughout my life, and the revelation of 222, and related to being the ox, I come to find out that it's Uriel, and Uriel holds the scroll and has prophecy with wisdom in the fire of light, which is the fire of God. That's pretty wild. 
That's pretty wild. Is it is it Uriel that's been leading us in this through the Holy Ghost? I have no idea. I don't pray to angels. I'm just saying that was very interesting because here we are on this on this understanding of these four living creatures. For which we see here you have the seven trumpets and you've got one, two, three, and then you've got the fourth one. And what happens? Verse 8, uh, uh, Revelation eight thirteen, And I beheld and heard an angel, listen to this, flying through the midst of heaven. That's interesting, right? And I, be, and I beheld and heard an angel flying <clears throat> through the midst of heaven. Well, if this is relating to the four uh, 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 living creatures, and one relating to the man on one direction, one the ox, one the eagle, and one the, 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 the lion. Who's the one who's flying through the midst of heaven? Well, according to Revelation 4, we see that the fourth one, <clears throat> or the one relating to an eagle, which is the fourth one, there's that word for eagle again, only used what? Four times, as I showed earlier, is the one that's what? Flying. The one that's flying is an eagle, and these guys are in heaven, recognized as cherubim, who are a type of angelic being, and one of them is an eagle. It's starting to make sense now why the KJV would have gone with using angel instead of eagle. You see, how are you going to go one, two, three, four? of those of the four living beings because remember they're holding back the winds they're holding back all these things from happening on the earth and then all of a sudden they release it after the 144 and the great multitude rapture come in trumpet judgments are about to start seven years of, tri of trumpet tribulation now mark's portion is over the world is over the great multitude has happened and now you've got your second set of seven years your final set of seven years and it starts with the four trumpets for which there are four winds that were being held back from the four angelic beings, which are the four living creatures. And the fourth one is an eagle flying through the midst. Let's see, where else do we see that? Let's, let's check this out. Let's go to Psalms, one of our old favorites here. Psalms 90 and 10. <clears throat> and what do we see? Psalms 90 and 10. The days of our years are three score and ten. That's 70. And if by reason of strength they're 80, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. That means 10 years. Tribulation, pain, wickedness, travail. That's the seven years of seals, first three years of trumpets, and then for it is soon cut off. Soon. About a few months, which makes it a total of what? About 10, okay, there's your 7, there's your 3 for a total of 10, and then in the 11th year, about 10 and a half, is your soon cut off. And what are they going to do? Do they walk away? Do they climb away? Are they whisked away? Is, is a branch broken off for them? No, look what it says. And we fly away. So. Here's a flying away. We see that at the at the end of that fourth trumpet judgment, that fourth angel is then declaring a woe, woe, woe for the next three trumpets that are remaining. And it's flying as an angel through heaven, as the eagle flying through heaven. What period of time is the fourth, or sorry, fifth trumpet, right? There's your fourth. It's ten and a half years, and there's what? Three trumpets left. There's three trumpets left. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And where is he declaring it? At the end of the fourth trumpet. At the end of the fourth trumpet, and what did we just show? Flying away. Then we fly away. 
and it's what 10 years and about six months about 10 and a half years and we fly away where's another one? Oh, watch this one <clears throat> this one was an awesome one this one really for people that are sometimes leery about the 14 years and the rebuilding that doesn't happen during seals except for the foundation that the actual rebuilding of the temple takes place in the first half of the seven years of trumpets this is where it locks in their understanding look at this first kings chapter 6 verse 37 and 38 in the fourth year okay tribulation picture in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the lord laid in the month of ziph okay so tribulation starts by the about the middle time of tribulation of seals the first seven years only the foundation is laid during the seals jump trump uh judgments it'll get broken up it won't get completed only the foundation the rest will be stopped and then it says in the 11th year wait a second here we are again in the 11th year so 10 years in a bit in the 11th year so we just saw that by the fourth year the foundation was laid and in the 11th year which means what seven years before the temple is complete and what does it say in the 11th year in the month of bull which is the eighth month was the house finished seven years in building it once the foundation was laid once the foundation was laid it was seven years in building for a total of what there's your 10 years and your short period of time soon this is when messiah gets cut off this is the 10 and a half years when messiah is cut off who was here in the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple this is the exact same time of the end of the fourth trumpet and the whoa 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 because of the next three trumpets that are going to be released in the final three and a half years of tribulation and what's there an angel or an eagle or an angel eagle right because if you remember if that's not enough evidence from four places or three places for you let me solidify it with one more in revelation chapter 12 check it out revelation chapter 12 we've got a video just solely on revelation chapter 12 showing you that revelation chapter 12 is the woman sign that'll be seen the pre-trib is taken the 40 days of the son of man the tribulation of seals the pre -trib, uh, the the mid-trib great multitude rapture was caught up the 1260 days while the city and the streets are being rebuilt and michael is fighting against the dragon and his angels <coughs> and at the end of the 1260 at mid trumpets which is in the 11th year satan is cast out <coughs> satan is cast out who's called what the old serpent so he's the great dragon called the old serpent the devil and satan so this is in the 11th year and when he's cast out here comes the first woe because the first woe is the fifth trumpet you see and what does it say having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time because of the final three and a half years of tribulation of the 14 two and a half are his and what does he do well let's have a listen revelation tw chapter 12 now uh, let's go verse 13 first and when the dragon saw that he was cast down cast unto the earth he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child and the woman and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time this is three and a half years the comma and in comma and means one plus two plus a half that's three and a half years there's only three and a half years left at this point and she what she's going to be taken to a place flying on the wings of a great eagle until the 14 years are over satan though only has a short time his is the one from daniel chapter 12 verse i think 7 that it says it'll be time times and a half 
There's no end in Daniel chapter 12, which means there's no addition here. It means one, two plus a half. Because Satan's going to have two and a half of the final three and a half years. Hence again, that brother being told by the Lord 14 years, about a year ago, leaving about 13 years. This year. Because the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of 13, which is the end of Satan's two and a half years. And how does the first woe open uh, begin? The opening of the pit. But look who took them away. This is, this is when the Jews who were there with the Lord in the city and the streets and the temple were being rebuilt. And they were there. They were there rebuilding it. It says in Zechariah 8, let your hands be strong. And you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he, re or when he returns. What was it? Uh, uh, no, that's the other part. In, in, uh, in Zechariah 12, when it says, let your hands be strong. Because now they're going to start to rebuild. For before this time, there was no rebuilding. There was no man, no woman, no beast available. For I had set everyone against his neighbor. That's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Because he had set the tribulation. But once the seals are over, the rebuilding is going to start. And at mid-trumpets, when Messiah gets cut off, the great eagle, which is exactly in the same spot, is going to fly them away into a place protected. Well, lo and behold, what do we see here? This is mid-trumpets, as we've been teaching for a long time, and what do we see? It represents the what? The good side, Dan Eagle, and it also represents the serpent bad side. Remember that? Dan has a good side eagle, has a bad side serpent, and it just so happens that there's a serpent who's called a dragon, the devil and Satan, and he's a serpent. Funny how that works. One is a serpent, one is an eagle. But you know that Satan isn't only a serpent? You know the, the dragon who is also a serpent, but do you know what this connects to? There's also a bad flying being. Isn't there a principality of the air? Right? Is there a principality of the air? Let's listen to a little bit more of this and see what he has to say for us next. Um, so... It um, what, what, what would M U be? It's a, it's a different manuscript. manuscript yeah. And M, I don't know mm -hmm. with those manuscripts. Yeah, it's a different, if it's a different manuscript. So we have two different manuscripts here, um, which may be an angelic eagle. Which <laughs> there you go. Maybe you could think of it like that. Have you, has anybody ever heard of the Z? Here you see that an angelic eagle. First of all, I needed to stop to this so you guys are reminded of this. Okay, an angelic eagle. We know an angelic eagle, okay? This is, and we know now the timing of this angelic eagle who flies them away into the wilderness to a place protected. But did you know that there's another type of eagle? <clears throat> the one that's in Revelation chapter 8 is this one from Revelation chapter 4. This angel is the flying eagle, see, through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. When you go to Revelation chapter 12, and it told us now Satan has been cast down, and it says now is the first woe, it says to the inhabitants of the earth. <laughs> Not too hard to figure out, right? So then who is this dragon one? Because like I said in the beginning, we've taught on Bohemoth. We taught on Leviathan. We know that Leviathan is the beast Antichrist, and we know that Bohemoth is the beast false prophet. So is there a third beast? Is there, a prof is there another third enemy? Well, of course there is. It's Satan. Because remember, you just saw it right here. Satan is cast down, and it's the first woe. 
if we go to the first woe in Revelation chapter 9, and I saw the fifth angel sounded, uh, and I saw a star fall, uh, a star fall from heaven. Well, hold on. A star fall from heaven when Satan is being cast down? Somebody's opening this bottomless pit. And when the bottomless pit is opened, who do we know is coming out of the bottomless pit? Of course, it's the beast Leviathan. Because the Le beast Leviathan, as we all know, was killed at the end of seals. It's the answer to Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was, which is Revelation 13, the first when he's here for 42 months and about the second half of seals, and is not because he's killed at the end of seals and during the first half of trumpets, he's not here, and shall ascend what? Out of the bottomless pit. He goes to perdition when the pit is opened at what? You guessed it. Mid trumpets, about ten and a half years into tribulation. When is the pit opened? At the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet. When Satan has lost his battle and has been cast down. So when Satan has been cast down, Antichrist, beast, comes now out of the pit. And we know that the false prophet, beast, behemoth, didn't get killed at the end of seals. Now all three of them are there together. One is out of the sea, Bohemoth. One is from the earth. Uh, sorry, one is out of the sea, Leviathan, who is the Antichrist beast. One is out of the earth, Bohemoth beast. Who's the third one? Well, if you have sea, earth, and air. Air. There's one in the air. And there just so happens to be a good angelic being flying through the air who's taking them into a place protected. Why would he be flying unless maybe he's got this competitor who's flying, who's going after them? Check it out. Watch this. Viv, V I V. Yeah. You have to go up here to the search bar. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 8, go down to verse 13. I'm going to go interlinear. And it, it breaks first as if it's if it if it's with those manuscripts. Yeah, it's yeah. a different if it's a different manuscript. So we have two different manuscripts here. Um, which may be an angelic eagle, which maybe you could think of it like that. Have you, has anybody ever heard of the Ziv V I V? Yeah. You have heard of this? So oh, yeah, in the mid, yeah. in the Midrash there's this great uh, it's like a great um, how do you want to call it? It's like this great bird. It's like almost like a you have the, the, the creature of the sea, which is Leviathan. You have the creature of the earth, which is Behemoth. And then you have the creature of the air, which is the Ziz in, in Jewish. Ha ha. So you have Bohemoth, you have Leviathan, and then you have the creature of the air. This was a question that that person was saying, oh, you, but you don't talk about the third one. Well, actually, we do, but we just never identified them as the Ziz. Okay, so what do we get? A giant bird-like creature. And you've got, of course, Bohemoth, who is from the earth. You've got Leviathan from the sea, which we've already identified in Revelation chapter 13, which we've done the video on. We see the beast rising up out of the sea. There's your Leviathan as your as your beast system and, and beast antichrist. Then you have another beast coming up out of the earth. This is the false prophet. We know this is the false prophet because of what he does in getting people to worship the image. And we know when he's killed, he's called the false prophet at the end who got people to worship the image and, and worship the first beast that was before him. One from the sea, one from the earth. Where's the third? The third is, of course, the one called the Ziz, who is a flying bird from the sky. Who do we know is of the air? Let's have a quick read. Let's go into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of of this world according to the prince of the power of the air 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Hello. You should go read the rest of it too. All right? So we know that there is the prince of the power of the air. And the prince of the power of the air that is is Satan. Satan is cast down. And when he's cast down, you've got a good angelic flying eagle that takes them into the wilderness. This is why this was so powerful to see that every other writing on it that doesn't call this an angel but calls it an eagle is so important to us. To I, I, I've never even heard in anybody's readings ever that the the angel in Revelation 8.13 is an eagle. I have never ever heard of this before. Do you know why it's so important to us? Because we have revealed that this is the exact time that the eagle, the flying eagle, at about ten and a half years in the midst of the seven year portion of trumpet judgments, in the ten and a half years since the 14 years begin, that this is when the eagle. The flying eagle takes them into the wilderness. We have revealed this without ever knowing it. Six and a half years. This is what I'm telling you. You see, is it that the, is it that the King James was wrong? No. Because this is one of the four angelic uh, cherubim. It is an angel flying through the midst which is the eagle in heaven. And it's exactly the time frame that we show that the eagle takes them into the wilderness when the serpent is cast down. Like, this, so now, now you're getting what I was talking about at the beginning. And I'm explaining that, you know, I, I sometimes pray to the Lord and, and I just, you know, because it, it's not easy. Okay, it's it's not easy. I mean, life isn't crazy hard or anything, but there's always these ups and downs and the emotion of of understanding these things and and trying to share it with people and just the the emotional drain and the, the, the strength and all of it. It just sometimes gets very weighty. And so sometimes I would have those conversations with the Lord. And then, you know, for the past several months or year, it's just like, look, you already know, stupid. How much more do you need to know that what has been revealed is understood and true? When hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places over six and a half years, every time something new is found, it's exactly where it was already revealed in the previous ones. Before you even knew there was an understanding of that, it was there revealing what you already knew. How many hundreds of times has this happened here? Over and over and over and over again. This is why I, I get it. I know the Lord's not going to give me a vision or a dream or any of these things. That's not what my purpose is meant for. I have a pretty good understanding of what my purpose is. I know what I'm doing. And this is just one of those, another one of those things that just says, oh man. There it is. Six and a half years of revealing the exact timing of the eagle that flies them into the wilderness. And it turns out this word was actually the eagle flying. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it's at the same time because he's warning now that the ziv, the ziz is coming, who is another flying type creature, which is the one who is what? The prince of of the power of the air well how about that there is one called a prince who comes at mid trumpet judgments about ten and a half years when the flying eagle takes them into the wilderness and lo and behold the enemy which is the prince of the air Listen to what we read here. Remember how we show Daniel 9 is really about 14 years? Listen to this. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. You see, because it's going to be attacked and destroyed. But there's going to be a commandment to restore and to build it unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. This is seven weeks as years. Seven years of Feast of Weeks. Seven years. These are the seven years of seals. Okay? They're, they're not going to be rebuilding Jerusalem during the seven years of seals. Only the foundation will get laid. And then you have comma and, meaning a separate period of time added to it. And what is three score in two weeks? Well, two years and 60 in actual weeks is about three years and two months. So you've got about the time frame of about 10 and a half years, 10 years and two or three months. And what does it say is going to happen in those about three and a half years, the first half of trumpet judgments? The street. And the city shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, so after the seven weeks as years, and the about three and a half years of trumpet judgments, for a total of ten years and change, for a total of what? Ten years in change, which means in the eleventh year, it says, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, listen to this, and the people of the prince that shall come. The people of the prince, lower P, that shall come. Messiah is the uppercase. Messiah, uppercase M, uppercase P. The people of the prince that shall come. Who is a prince coming at mid trumpets? Whoops, I don't know what happened there. Who is the prince coming? At mid trumpets in the eleventh year after ten, who is called the prince of the power of the air, whose name is Ziph, is coming at the time of the first woe when the pit's going to be opened and all three of them will be there. All three of the enemies. How many times was that? Is this the fifth place or sixth place I just showed it? is when the little P prince comes in the 11th year. When was the temple built and completed once everything was done? In the 11th year. When did they when did they fly away on the wings of an eagle? In the 11th year. At the first woe. Over and over Psalms 90 and 10, 10 years then a short time and then we fly away. Only to find out it was there the whole time in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, the angelic flying eagle, exactly where the scriptures have revealed it, where we had never known it was there. We've been revealing it for probably close to six years, five and a half years. Isn't that awesome? These are the types of things that I really hope, and, and my purpose with this isn't just building it up and, and, and giving a refresher and, you know, yes, repetition and, and building these pieces into these other parts we've already known and confirming these other things. Repetition is key, like anything that you want to be good at understanding. It is all about repetition. But more than that, I also hope it really grabs your attention to stop and say whoa how could this how how could this all be wrong if at every turn on every teaching all of these new parts and new pieces and more confirmations continuously tell us the same story hundreds of times ponder that Consider it. It, it. It's impossible. That's the answer. It is impossible to do unless it's true. Unless the revelations are true. The understanding of them is true. There is no other, there, there's no other way to explain it. We're being given the open book. 
And it's being revealed and confirmed piece by piece by piece until he comes to that group of remnant and completes the story for them and gives them the power and the authority and then the anointing of the Holy Ghost to go and do his work, to finish his work in his power and authority during the time of seals. That's why this group is going to be glorified as he was glorified. This, I don't mean just us, but this group of workers. That's why they're going to be taking part in his glorifying. That's why they get part in it. Just like Romans 8 said. Because they're the ones doing his work for him here during that time. Just like they did in the is when he left and the disciples went out at that point. Now you know that in fact they are Gentiles. That the disciple workers are Gentiles. They are a priestly line from among the Gentiles of the pre-trip. You see how it all makes sense? It all flows together? These are all things we've taught that we're now confirming with greater pieces, explaining the exact same story that we've already understood. Confirming it over and over and over again. It's impossible. It can't not be true if we can show it and you follow it along yourselves, chapter and verse and, and definition over and over and over, and you see it all for yourselves. It's all true. It's 14 years, brothers and sisters, and there's a period called above. And I believe in the revelation of it all that we've been shown. That's all that's left. We've got a jubilee count all the way since Christ. That has to come at the end of the final seventh Sabbath. That has to be trumpeted on the Day of Atonement at the end of the final 49th, the final seven, which is the 49th of the sevens of a jubilee count. We're here. I absolutely believe we are here. I know we've understood the timing. Luke's doesn't say nobody knows the day or hour, so we know it's not Feast of Trumpets. Luke's is actually the bigger mystery than Mark and Matthew. Although Mark's is actually a big mystery too, because they didn't know when. They might think it's coming on the day and hour no one knows, but that's when Christ is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, right? To the start of the seventh. But we know theirs, they don't know when it is yet because they'll have to wait till the time of first or second Passover of the midst of that seventh year. It's just incredible. So, so, so incredible. Guys, man, let me finish it up with this. I went and looked up. See this word for eagles? Matthew 24, 28. Notice how it's not in any other discourse. Well, you're going to find out that the place where it's mentioned outside of Revelation 4 is all related to the Lord's coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives. This word for eagles, now look at this. In the KJV, of course, because it's only used four times. But look what happens when you scroll through to understand where it's talking about. Look at where it says, Matthew, okay, we got that one. Luke, okay, we got that one. Revelation 4, Revelation 12. Oh, look at that. They're telling us right here in Blue Letter Bible that it's also associated as the eagle of the other four from Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. Yet they don't show it. You see? Another piece confirming the timing of it, act or the understanding of it actually being there. So now let's go have a look. We know that there's the Revelation 4 1 is the good eagle taking them into the wilderness. The angelic eagle flying them into the wilderness to the place protected. We know that Revelation 12 14 is them on the wings of that eagle going into the place protected. And then we have what? In Luke 37, it says, uh, in Luke 37, and they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now watch this. I'll finish it up with this on the eagles. Remember we were in Luke 17 earlier? Watch what happens. It's the storyline of the end of days. 
That's why it's, this is all prophecy in Luke 17 here. The coming of the kingdom. It even goes back to the story of the lepers, right? The one that was cleansed, the Samaritan, the, the Gentiles, right? The stranger, the Samaritan in relation to them being grafted in. Ten were cleansed. Only one came back to worship the Lord. So ten of them cried out to Christ and believed in him. Only one came back and gave him worship. That's the pre-trip. The pre-trib is that one of 10. It is the pre-trib 10% of the church. 10% of all believers are going pre-trib. That's what it is. And then listen to what it says. There's the coming of the kingdom. We shared this earlier. He says, for as lightning lighteth under one and part under heaven, so shall it be in the day of the son of man, right? In his day. We then have, but first, we know it relates to the 40 days of the son of man. When he's here as and when he comes after the wedding at the start in the in the 50 days portion, then we see Luke 17, 27 uh, until they married. So that's talking about the 40 days again. Then we see in verse 28, likewise, also. So another storyline. This is your the pre trip has happened. And this is the 40 days of the son of man. Then he says, likewise, also. As it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank. But listen to what it says. You see, they were, they were eating and drinking in Luke's portion in relation to the 40 days. But when it comes to Lot, they add, bought, and sold. They bought, they sold. This word for bought and this word for sold is the same buying and selling of Revelation chapter 13. Hello. You see, this is relating now to Luke's group, uh, sorry, to Mark's group, those that are going to be going during the time of seals. And what does it say? The days of Lot. Watch this. We talked about it in the previous video when we went to uh, Abraham. OK. We saw Abraham and his brothers. Haran is the pre-trib Luke group. And I believe remnant workers called Mountaineers. Then we had Nahor, who is the sleeping church, right? And then you've got Abraham, God's people. So it's like the pre-mid post or a group from Luke, a group from Mark and Matthew. And look at what happens. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. What happens? Haran dies. Haran. So I said in the previous video, it's a picture of like the pre-trib, the, the Haran group, the Luke group going but there's also a remnant that remains to work. And what are they going to do? Is it a lot? Well, look what happens. Who ends up taking Lot? And Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, because Haran is dead. So Lot is still there. Lot is that, that group during that period of time. It's the same type of picture that we're getting in it so now look at what happens it brought that brought us towards the end of seals and then we know from verse 24 that this is at the end of trumpets and the coming of the lord so you've got him coming for 40 days you've got him coming at the end of seals and then this is when he's coming feet down on the mount of olives in his day listen to this as lightning from one end unto the other. Listen to what it says about that time. Okay. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Uh, remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Okay, watch this. Starting in verse 34. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and one shall be left. In verse 37 of Luke 17, And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered. Okay? A sound body, soma, body as a whole, where the eagles will be gathered. When? When one will be taken, one will be left, which is related now to the time when he's coming 
as lightning from one end unto the other. And it had to do with what? The eagle's time. The eagles, we know, represent the second half of trumpets. We know in this eagle time that there is the good eagle that flew them away into the wilderness. And we know there's this other eagle of the air who is the enemy. And what's going to happen? Is, is there going to be a killing, a, a carcasses, and, and death and destruction? By the end of trumpets? Well, let's go see. You see, in Luke 21, in the story, Luke 17 is the, is the big outline of it. In Luke 21... There's no mention of eagles. There's no mention of the Lord coming as lightning. There's no mention, of course, of the day and hour. And there is no mention of one will be taken and one will be left. Now we go to Mark. Let's go see if Mark's discourse is talking about this period of time. There is no mention of eagles. No mention where the carcass and eagles are. There's no mention of the coming of the Lord and it relating to one being taken and one being left. Okay? It's not there. It's about watching. This is to the end of seals. Watch and pray. Again, you know, this is so exciting because when you, when you understand that the Lord's coming on the day and hour no one knows in Mark's discourse, which is at the end of six to start that seventh year of seals, yet they don't know when they're going yet, it tells you right here in Mark 9, 1, part way through. Which uh, and some of them standing here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. It's a past tense. They see him coming at the end of six days or six years, but they don't know when they get to go. That's why it was so powerful in Jeremiah to see when the great multitude go when he comes as Messiah Ben Ephraim or Ben Joseph, and he's coming, but they don't go. Their time isn't till Passover. Okay, so very exciting. But you saw there was no eagle. None of those mentions. Not related to him coming as lightning from one end to the other. But look what happens when we come into Matthew. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. After the abomination of desolation. Watch this. Starting in Matthew 24, verse 27. For as lightning, for as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming which is only used four times in Matthew's discourse out of all the Gospels because it's about his coming when? It's about his coming on the day and hour no one knows at the end of 13 to the start of the 14th year. <clears throat> and it says, uh, uh, As lightning shineth uh, from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together and what do you see immediately after the tribulation of those days this is the sign of the son of man this is the three days and three nights in the belly of the earth and resurrecting on the fourth and he's coming feet down on the mount of olives on the day and hour no one knows and these are the days of noah that represent not just the 40 days that luke's discourse represent but the final year that final 14th year of tribulation, which is as it was in the days of Noah. And look at what he tells them, starting in verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two, uh-oh, here it is. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, one shall be left. Watch therefore, for you know not when the hour of the Lord cometh, but this know that if the good man of the house had known at which watch the thief would come, he would have not have suffered his house to be broken in. So what are you seeing? <clears throat> You're seeing that he's coming on the day and hour, feast of trumpets that no one knows to start the 14th year. He's coming as lightning from one end unto the other after the place where the eagles of the carcasses have been gathered, whereas you saw in, in Luke's, it was about the body because there's the good ones and the bad ones, carcasses, right? And it says that it'd be a time as it was in the days of Noah. And days of Noah is only in Matthew, as you know, 
because the days of Noah was one year and ten days, because on the tenth day is atonement from trumpets to trumpets, and that final year, ten more days are added, the 49th year, and on atonement, it's the announcing of the Jubilee, just as the revelation has revealed the seventh, fourteenth year, the seventh year of trumpets, the Lord is here, feet down Mount of Olives, and it's the final as it was in the days of Noah. And when it's all over, on the tenth day, on the day of atonement, is the sounding of the shofar of the blast of the final jubilee. And there's your two will be taken, one will be left story. All of it, guys, in order. The eagles are understood now. And the mystery of the one eagle revealed and confirming the revelation as it had been understood here for at least five and a half years. This is powerful, guys. So, so exciting. Ponder these things. Realize what is being said. That these things have been revealed here before we knew these things were here. We understood it through revelation of Scripture. This is how it always happens. We reveal it through Scripture. The understanding comes. We get it in part, and it builds, and it builds, and we've got the picture of it. Then somebody within the ministry is doing digging and is diligently seeking and is searching things, trying to see if these things are true, and then comes across things like this and says, oh, my goodness, check this out. And it's exactly what we revealed. And then somebody says, you know, you should really go and check this out. I think it said eagle. Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere, but, and then I'm shared by somebody else because the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to look at this because you'll be amazed when you find out what it's telling you, what it's confirming to you. Doing the exact same thing, showing that in fact, the angel is an eagle and it's the one that flies through heaven and it's directly related to the mid trumpets, the good eagle against the serpent prince of the air mid trumpets about ten and a half years into tribulation wild wild awesomeness confirming over and over and over again brothers and sisters God is good the spirit is leading I pray this blesses you I pray it excites you as it does me you know some people might think it's just confirmation but for me it's it's more wowness. It's just we just saw like what half a dozen places that confirmed that it was all true that we knew before we even knew that was that. To be able to add to that picture, to be able to understand these things with greater understanding, with greater detail. Man, God is good. The word is true. The books are open. The spirit is leading. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.